Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up this week's theme of jazzy drumming outside of jazz, looking for places where we can find jazz-like drumming, but not in the jazz genre. I mean, it, it's kind of self-explanatory as a theme, <laughs> and it's sort of a running joke now at the end of the week that I'm still explaining it. Anyways, we're going to be checking out uh, the artist Willow at uh, her Tiny Desk concert. We're going to be checking out the first track from this concert called Symptom of Life. Let's dive into it. We got uh, a bass. Oh, the drummer has a guitar too. That's interesting. We have a, a bass guitar, an electric guitar, vocals, and drums, at least from the thumbnail. I'm interested. Let's dive in. See what Willow's bringing to the table with Symptom of Life. Is that nine? No. No, it's eight. There's an interesting pickup at the beginning of the piano line. They have that cool syncopated uh, dotted note rhythm going on with all of them. Creating a polyrhythm against the drums. And the drums have an interesting accent pattern too. So there's a really cool stacking and layering of rhythms in this track. Mm. Bringing in this funky beat. Even the vocals are very rhythmic. <laughs> it's our first non-rhythmic element here, just providing this, this uh, drone around the song. Yeah, pulling that rhythmic phrase across the bars, too. Mm, there's a curiosity to the harmony as well. A little bit of, uh... Yeah. A little bit of grit on that belt. Mm, dang, that bass work. I have some really cool parallels here for, you know, our typical rock, rock uh, audience on the channel. Mm, dang, that was good. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot of really awesome things going on here. Um... So we have a song here. Oh man, is there jazz drumming in here though? I think the closest would have been the cross stick uh, idea at the end underneath the funky bass. That's probably the jazziest we get, but that was very rock. You might be able to find that in the rockier side of jazz, but mm, I think you'd be hard pressed to find that in any of the traditional styles of jazz. But I can kind of see where somebody might feel that it's a bit jazzier. 
given the funky syncopation on it and the light use of the snare since we're cross sticking which is where you actually lay the stick across the drum itself you lift it up and smack it against the rim so there's still a little bit of a hit as the vibration goes through the stick into the bottom end of it which is still on the drum head itself but most of it is that clack sound that you're going to get from the wood against the steel on the rim um so yeah like i said there's I can see where somebody gets a little bit of a jazzy vibe from it. But like I've said all throughout this week, this would be a tough uh, theme for me to suggest anything for. And I honestly don't know how often you're going to find pure 100% jazz drumming anywhere outside of jazz. Unless the band itself is rooted in jazz some way and moves from like one genre and then has like a random jazz section in the middle of a song right where everybody kind of jazzes it up jazz drumming just doesn't fit a lot of uh genres <laughs> outside of jazz when you look at what the other instruments are bringing so again i wasn't too strict about what was being presented this week as long as there's some fun drumming in it and yeah this was fun if a bit more standard than i think i was expecting for the week but the thing is, though, is that I have a fantastic discussion for this song, so I'm I'm glad it made it regardless. Um, so yeah, right off the start, what's the thing that's most important with this song? To me, it's rhythm, right? Right off the bat, we have this fun dotted note idea. And what a dot does is when you put it on a note, it, um, it tells the performer that this note is going to take up one and a half times its normal length. So, so this song is in 4-4. Four, four. Quarter notes get the beat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So each quarter note is one beat long. A dotted quarter note would be one and a half beats long, which creates a bit of oddity. If we count half beats, each bar is going to get eight of those. And so if we have dotted quarter notes, it would be three and then three, and then there's only two beats left over in the bar. So if you do another dotted quarter note, you're actually going to take up those two plus one half beat from the next bar. Um, and we actually see plenty of this where I had mentioned, oh, they're taking the rhythmic phrasing across the bar. And that's what I mean when I said that during the reaction is that the phrase didn't clean itself up within the bar itself and the rhythmic elements pulled over into the next bar which created some of the oddities i heard at the beginning of the track when we just had i think it was the drums and piano oh no we kicked it off with just the piano and i was trying to figure out what time signature we were in and i was like nine because that would be three groups of three that's what felt right at the time <laughs> Um, and then I thought there was an interesting pickup at it because it it would be a bar 4-4 four, four with an extra half of a beat on it. So I was like, oh, maybe it's a pickup where you have this extra half of a beat before the phrase itself starts on that, you know, beat one. But the more I listened to the drums when they came in, I was like, no, this isn't 4-4. Four, four. And that's when it started to dawn on me that some of these rhythmic ideas are just progressing far past the initial bar. And so I couldn't count each phrase as one bar each. And there's a lot of rhythmic things that go on in the second bar that allow it to line back up so that the next, uh, the third bar, the idea starts on the downbeat again. So it kind of lines back up there every other bar. Um, and so we have this, uh, this cool phrasing going on here right from the start where it feels like it's in three, but it's actually in four. And we have this cool three against four polyrhythm going on. This is present pretty much all throughout the song. Now, once the vocals come in, because the guitar and bass go along with the piano's uh, dotted quarter note idea here. Quarter note. I don't know why I said note. <laughs> uh, good old tongue just doing whatever it wants. Um... So yeah, the guitar and the bass, though, they're going along with this. The drums are giving us our 4-4 four, four polyrhythm. The vocalist comes in, though, and it's rapid fire, constant eighth notes. Da, 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 da. Well, actually, no, those would be... Does she, does she go into a, a triplet flow every once in a while? Maybe so. Anyways, what I'm getting at, though, is we have... So... 
the bass, the guitar, and the piano are playing these longer notes. Like I said, it's a beat and a half each. She decides when she comes in to just come rapid fire. Eighth notes, triplets, whatever. She's definitely playing or, or singing multiple beats or multiple notes per beat, whether it's two or three. She is laying down more notes than anybody else in the band. It gives the song what felt like something that kind of leaned back, even dragged a little bit once I felt the 4-4, an energy, a direction, a push. And you may have noticed this is the third different rhythm going on. As I had mentioned, it's layers upon layers upon layers of rhythm. I really love this. It gives the song a very cool feeling. Because when you remove the rhythmic aspects... If we look at the harmony, the chord progressions we have, the melody, the notes that the lead vocals are singing, it's a pop track. We're going to explore the emotional level of it a little bit later, but there's a lot of poppy things going on in here which help add to the palatability of it. There's a lot of complexity underneath the surface, but I think Willow is also touching on something here that I think would be palatable for a lot of people. It fits really well within that pop framework of your mainstream audience. And a lot of that comes from the surface level stuff here, the way that it sounds, the melodies that she's singing. But it's not a simple song, and beneath that, that surface is where you get all these complexities. And I absolutely love that about uh, this entire song right here. It's the first thing I've ever heard from Willow. I think this came from a new album. I'm pretty sure I saw her name in the new releases list. And it might actually be in my list of albums to check out. I don't remember. If not, this song definitely tells me that I need to check her work out. Um, but yeah, that mix between uh, you know simplified hook where you can get the average person to listen to it, and then the added complexity underneath, I think, is what really delivers this song and elevates it past her contemporaries, what immediately makes me more interested in her than other pop songs. Where was I going with all of this? I honestly don't remember. <laughs> um, well, let's just awkwardly move somewhere else. There's another rhythmic layer that comes in around the second verse that I thought was very cool. If the piano is giving us one rhythm and the drums are giving us another and the vocals are giving us another, what does the guitar do when it decides to offshoot away from the piano and explore something else? Drone. I thought this was wild. I don't know what the device is called, but I presume that it puts some vibrations through the string and just allows it to constantly vibrate and create a tone. And the, the guitar just kind of allows it to hang in the air, whatever note this is. I don't think it can play chords. I don't think it was wide enough to vibrate multiple strings. And I really only remember one note coming out of it. But, you know, with pedals and stuff, you can duplicated and pitch shift the duplications and stuff like that so it's possible to turn that one note into a, a chord but I don't recall hearing that um, but it provides another rhythmic element in a, a sort no rhythm this was very cool because a lot of the song is rhythmically dense which means that uh, the textures of the harmonies kind of get lost a little bit as so many notes are coming out at so many times and they're so rhythmically complex where you're listening to multiple different types of rhythms going off at one time, it's very easy to lose the chordal information through all of this and even some of the melodic information as she does move through these notes rather quickly, it's easier to pick up on the rhythmic flow of her vocals more so than the melodic or harmonic. So what the guitar does is it kind of creates this wall on the outside that says this is our bass notes. Everything else is going to be immediately heard against it. And I really love that. It allowed me to get in touch with the emotional elements of the song a lot easier because everything else is about trying to hear all of the notes being played, smash them together, in my mind into a stack and trying to feel oh what kind of chord is this what kind of key are we in what would that 
What, what, what kind of information would that tell me? And when there's so much stuff like that, it's, it's difficult to cut through all the other elements and visualize that. But we get this one note coming through, and that means that every note played becomes, in a sense, a dyad, which is a chord of two notes. It means I can get immediate harmonic information at every moment without trying to visualize the information that is disguised underneath the performance. And at this moment, something clicked in me. This song is about wonder. I don't remember what word I used during the reaction. I think that's a shame because I really liked that word. But to me, the song embodies a feeling of wonder, of, of knowing there's something else out there and trying to find it, having that curiosity. Maybe that was the word I used. That sounds familiar. Of, I don't necessarily want to say it feels childlike. I know childlike wonder is a phrase that I think gets overused sometimes because adults can be wondrous as well. But it definitely has that feeling of wanting to know more of an insatiable hunger of wanting to uh, explore the extents of something to be completely exhaustive in a topic to delve into it as thorough as possible. And it's not just for this raw element of knowledge. It comes from a genuine curiosity. What could be there? Not there is something there. I must know it and document it and have this knowledge. But the wonder of, is there even anything there? And if so, what is it? And it, I feel like that's a little bit more lighthearted than um, more like a scientific engagement of knowledge. And the song just embodies that. It is light, it is energetic, it is rhythmically playful, and I think that playfulness really drives forward this, this type of wonder, uh, this type of amusement. This need for exploration, not because of any personal gain, but just a raw curiosity. Again, it's not there is something there I need it. It's, it's could there be something there? And I feel like that type of exploration just carries a different vibe. And this song absolutely leans into it. And I think a lot of it does come down to that rhythmic playfulness. There are very few songs, I think, that put a smile on my face. I don't re-watch most of my videos. Um, I do scrub through them at times because I, I like all my thumbnails to have a face that is actually from that video. Um, and so I do go through them. I see my faces in general. But I don't think I smile a lot during reactions themselves. Moments, for sure. But there's always this analytical part of my brain. What's over there? What's over there? What's this doing? How does that relate to this? I, I have an entire thought process going on while I listen to the music. And, uh, you know, this song, uh, it never pulled me out of it completely, but there's such an unfiltered joy to this song that I feel like I was smiling a lot during it. And that just doesn't happen too often. It's just... It's a wonderful, beautiful work. And as soon as the song was over, I was I said something like, yeah, that was good, or something like that. It was just like such a reflex to acknowledge that what I listened to was just fantastic. I enjoyed every moment of it from, bro from both a critical or analytical angle, but also just the sheer joy of casual listening, of enjoying the sounds that were entering my brain without having to figure out what it all meant. I just liked the way it sounded. The last thing I want to bring up before we go into the lyrical dive is simply that funky section. I love this because it embodies many of the same ideas that are present in the rest of the song as well. It's still rhythmically syncopated. There's a lot of rhythmic information here. Um, the drums and the bass are working together to create some cool polyrhythmic ideas. The piano comes in and adds more layers on top of that. Um, 
But I do love how it sort of takes a moment to step back and say, well, what if we simplified some of this? And so the drum polyrhythms aren't quite as complex as they are in, say, the first section of the song. And the bass just gets into this super funky groove. And it's not so much of, uh, you know, listen to all these layers, listen to complexity. It's more of like, yeah, this is complex, but, you know, dang, I just want to move my body. I don't want to think about it. I just want to groove with what they're doing. And it takes a lot of the... Uh, the same compositional elements and just reduces it down into something well, groovy. And I dig that. I did say that would be the last thing I talked about, but you know, it dawned on me. I don't know who Willow is. I don't know. I've, I've been calling her the artist. Oh, Willow is the artist. Uh, Willow, the artist has been, is referred to in the singular form in the description so i'm going to assume it's the vocalist honestly this vocalist should just use this band all the time and give themselves a band name but you know maybe that doesn't work in in publicity and stuff i don't know anyways just like this whole band is awesome and i've talked about the band and the music way more than the vocalist and i suppose i should talk about the vocals a little bit because they are equally as awesome as everything else going on. One of the things I absolutely love about the vocals is the way that even... Well, let me start that over again. The vocalist likes to use a lot of runs, starting from one note, moving to another, and hitting various points in between. So it's not a slide where you're just going, ah. There's specific notes hit in between that give the the idea melodic flourish. But what I find really interesting about them is that they are utilized in rhythmic ways that play off of the energy of the song. They'll be super short and staccato, less of a legato sound. And what that means, legato is a very loose movement. Um, in As a horn instrument, an air instrument, I tend to use uh, my tongue to stop and start notes. And so for legato, I tend to think of la, 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 la. The notes sort of are still connected, but there is a soft stop between them versus staccato, which would be like a da, 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 a very short stop in the notes. Lots of space between them. Um, and she introduces a staccato idea to these faster runs. I think that's interesting, not only because it fits with what's going on, but it's also a bit atypical of how vocalists tend to implement runs in their music. Think of your Beyonce's or, uh, well, it shows how out of touch I am with the pop world. <laughs> Mariah Carey's, I suppose, a pull way back a couple decades. Um, Oh no, little notes, like, da, kind of slurring between all the notes, still stopping on specific notes. It isn't just a gradual movement, but there's there's not a lot of uh, room or space between the pitches themselves. They all just kind of move into one another with these hard stops. And she utilizes, or with these soft stops, and she utilizes very strict endings to some of these runs. I think that's very cool. And like I said, it matches the style of the song while still incorporating a technique that many vocalists in her genre utilize. But I also noticed that she will hold out a note at times and instead of just belting it out like pop stars will do, um, she'll go along with the rhythmic element and just put these stops in it. It's the same note. She'll be like, ah, 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 ah. And it's all just the same note. The pitch hasn't changed, but she'll put this uh, rhythmic element to it. And I think that's very cool, too. Once again, just a full acknowledgement of the type of music that they're playing, what kind of characteristics and properties of the song they are highlighting, and allowing those properties to exist and, and be put into the spotlight in her melodic writing as well. It goes along with the whole idea that there's so many rhythmic layers in here and she chooses not to have a more traditional pop style of holding out lots of notes. She's this rapid fire style, but it doesn't turn into rap or spoken word either. It is still melodically sung ideas. They're just very rhythmically static. And I think that's awesome. It's, it's just, like I said, this acknowledgement of what kind of music they're making and, and applying it to every aspect of the track. She did go into a really high belt at one time and put a little bit of rasp in there, and I thought that was pretty cool. That's not something you see too often in the pop field, or at least I don't. I, 
I'm not super versed in, in pop. I, I do like pop. <laughs> uh, pop music ends up in my album of the year almost every year, but uh, the mainstream pop world, I'm not too well versed in. Maybe it's becoming a more popular technique these days. Uh, but I thought that was pretty cool and uh, defining for me as a way of adding a little bit of her character to her style and separating her from, again, her contemporaries. I did say earlier, I know I said that would be the last one. <laughs> Things just keep popping up in the old brain. I did say earlier I was going to have a pretty neat uh, parallel for many of the rock and metal people in the audience who make up a majority of uh, of my audience, I suppose. I'd just use that word again. What I find really cool here, like uh, take uh, rock music, for instance, or any of the lighter metal stuff, uh, you know, melodic metalcore, uh, anything that would be metal in the popular sphere. A lot of the times you will have driving guitar riffs and then you'll have a vocalist do these long held out notes on top of it. And that's how you build everything rhythmically. You have the driving energy from the drums, your dun some cool like guitar riff going on, right? Lots of energy. And then you will have your vocals and they'll have these longer drawn out melodies both to stand out from the more chaotic playing, but also to act as this uh, this counterpoint to everything, just to provide more contrast to the song. That is very common in popular rocks and metals, and this is actually sort of an inversion of that, where the uh, the vocalist provides a lot of the forward rhythmic energy, the faster ideas, and then our instruments, particularly the piano and eventually the guitar, are the ones who play the longer held out ideas. So I thought that was pretty cool to showcase many of the same instruments, electric guitar, bass, drums, and vocals, um, in a little bit of a different style of composition. I'm going to take a moment here to look at the lyrics, and then we're going to wrap this one up. All right. I think earlier in the reaction, I used the phrase mystery, which kind of aligns itself with wanting to discover the mystery, the curiosity aspect that I went into. Um, but I think the term I wanted to use was mystery. And this song is about trying to find something. The, ver the first verse kicks off with pushing and peeling myself out of my disguise, looking at you, now I'm wondering, who am I? This idea of pushing and peeling off of a disguise is uh, looked at in the second refrain, says, like a snake shedding skin. I believe these are supposed to be understood uh, together, and that's, um, I don't know why snakes shed their skin. I mean, as usual... <laughs> I'm a composer, not uh, an, an animal scientist. I don't even know the word for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so th this idea of growing into your new self, right? Becoming who you're meant to be, shedding off the old. I think these are all the ideas that are supposed to be presented here. The idea after that says it's like a snake shedding skin, creating life to begin and all you know has vanished again transcending virtue and sin to me this talks about a cycle creating life to begin this idea of starting anew and it says when all you know has vanished again the idea of again to me it feels like cycles everything that you know has vanished so you're starting from a clean slate to me this is the cycles of growth whether that's growing from a child into a teen or a teen into an adult or a 20-something into a 30-something into a 40-something. As you grow older, hopefully, you gain more information, become wiser, and find ways that you can change yourself or the way that you understand the world. It's all about finding new perspective, broadening your horizons. If you stagnate, if you are the same person you were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you're not living life very well. You're not shedding your skin. You have all this dead baggage still on you. Shed it. Start anew. Get rid of everything that you've learned because you have a new perspective to view it from. That's what's being said here. Now the chorus 
goes in a little bit of a, di a different direction. And it feels like if you do this, this new information will make sense. Because it says, I feast my eyes on lower things while beauty is a symptom of life. I like that. I, I feel like lower things are supposed to be focusing on elements that um, aren't necessarily important to focus on. It might be, um, I don't know, focusing on things that don't make life better. They don't improve life. The annotation here aligns it with the surface level elements of Western society, such as money, power, and influence, and a lot of things that come from societal pressures of needing to have those. But I think it goes along with a lot more than that. It's simply chasing the ideas that don't mean much in the larger picture of things. Not about, sorry, not about improving your life immediately, but improving your life spiritually, internally, mentally, emotionally. Not about chasing the things that are ultimately going to bring you down. Um, and I like the idea that beauty is a symptom of life. You don't achieve beauty. It's not something you get by wearing the right clothes or the right makeup or having the right hair. It's just a part of life. By existing, you are beautiful. I really love that. The next line of the chorus says, Feast our eyes on lower things when suffering is craving the light. Not actually going into the light and exploring what it can be, what life could be without all this negativity. Wait, where was I going with that? It says that you shouldn't, you shouldn't just crave the light. You should explore it. You suffer by simply craving. Just go into it. See what life has for you. Don't, don't focus on all the, the garbage negativity. And want the, you know, I, I wish I had a better life. No, go out there and get it. Change your perspective on things. Maybe your life's already pretty good. That's kind of what I get out of it. The bridge goes into the idea that uh, we already have a lot of cool stuff on earth that is filled with awe or could fill us with awe. That life is fragile. We have to be okay with understanding our limited time here and to utilize that time well. It's also about taking the first step. It says, why wait for pain to change us? We don't have a lot of time. Change yourself first. I love this. It's, it's all about trying to be a better person. Changing your perspective on things. Not chasing worthless ideas. Go out there and live your best life is what this song says. You're already worthy. Just do it. And I know it's it's very uh, idealistic. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't necessarily want to put words in her mouth and say that uh, she doesn't understand that maybe this isn't something that everyone can do. But uh, I do think that on the base level, the, the song represents an idea of perspective shifting and so while not everyone can just go out there and change their life in a very literal way you can certainly change your perspective on life which i think is the ultimate message here stop chasing the worthless things stop waiting for your life to be different and just look at things differently it might provide some answers and if nothing else you might find some beauty and awe in the places you hadn't seen them before. Those are my thoughts. Willow's symptom of life. I think it all comes together rather well. Having a song that feels mysterious and curious. That is ultimately, lyrically, about engaging with that curiosity and finding out what's on the other side. But those are just my thoughts on it. What are yours? Hit me up in the comment section with your opinions perspectives on this track give me a different take on it if you have one i'm always open to seeing how other people interpret art above the comment section in the description box you'll find a link to linktree it takes you here you can find links to my music ways to support the channel a link to the discord server and so much more above that if you could like subscribe and ring the bell i greatly appreciate all three of those we do have one more video today. It'll be our last video for Pride Month. 
Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow. 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. We're going to check out an entire album. If you're new here because you're a fan of Willow, you probably won't want to come by for that. We're going to be checking out some Tomb Mold, which I believe is death metal. <laughs> going to be a very different change of pace, but I still appreciate any subscriptions. We do check out some stuff outside of metal from time to time. So if you enjoyed this, there's probably still stuff for you. Uh, and then, of course, on Sunday at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. UTC, we're going to do a live stream, two hours. Just come hang out with me. We're going to chit-chat, listen to some music, have some good conversation. It's a blast. If not, though, of course, Monday, we'll kick it off with next week's theme. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Thank you.